thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very glad to be with you virtually. Um, maybe it's fitting to have a virtual uh, seminar about online language revitalization, um, although I wish that I could visit with you in person one day. Um, I'm glad to be here and to learn also, I hope, from your experiences, because I'm going to talk about our um, online language revitalization projects for a language called Louisiana Creole, which is a language spoken in the state of Louisiana, in the United States of America. Um, this territory was historically controlled by the French before it became part of the United States. And the Louisiana Creole language originated in that uh, colonial period and in the interaction between enslaved people and uh, French colonists and the indigenous inhabitants of what became Louisiana. So um, I think it's very good to start with a very basic question. Um, what really is the role of the internet in language revitalization? It sounds very general, but if you see the number of articles in um, uh, news going back several years, uh, you can see a selection of them here. There is a kind of preoccupation with new technologies and in particular the internet as a savior of dying or endangered languages or minority languages. The question is, of course, whether this media hype really has anything to do with reality. Actually, it sounds very simple to say that the internet may save dying languages, as we see in this uh, headline. But actually, what does that mean? How does that happen? Is it simple uh, or is it complicated? Is an app enough to save a language? If you look at um, the internet and you Google all kinds of different small language names, you can find a number of resources which are available nowadays and actually have been available for almost two decades, really. I mean, the production of, for example, online dictionaries for um, minority languages is not a new thing. It's been going on for a very long time. And of course, the sharing of existing paper publications via PDF, for example, or HTML web pages. This is also um, an established practice by now. And there are several worthwhile projects that have been uh, conducted in this way. You can also find uh, websites such as this, the Endangered Languages Project, which aim to collect information about the threatened languages of the world and um, act as a kind of online museum exhibit in a way for these languages. This uh, could serve to raise awareness of language endangerment and also act as a kind of online archive for material in and about these particular languages. And of course, there are many examples of these you're probably familiar with, um, online archives such as this or wiki tongues um, and there are many, many others. So these resources fall under a particular uh, description for me. They, they seem to be sort of what I would think of as older style web resources or things which are part of um, what we could call the web 1.0. So this is the internet as it came into existence at the beginning of this millennium. And of course, it's great to have these resources. It's really super for archiving. It's um, exciting to share information um, and to uh, have a number of different kinds of learning, teaching and documentary uh, resources available. But we have to remember that if we want to revitalize a language, it's about more than just the availability of 
say, textbooks, dictionaries, um, etc. The goal, at least um, we could say the goal, is to reverse the shift from the endangered or minoritized language to the dominant language and to promote the transmission of the language between generations, that is between the uh, older generations who may still speak the language and especially uh, children or young people. And all of this does not involve textbooks necessarily. It's not something which a dictionary can do. Instead, it involves people, it involves activists, it involves learners of the language, it involves a kind of social movement that is organized around this one key task of reversing language shift. And this is where um, what we can call Web 2.0, that is social media, etc., becomes really important and really valuable uh, for language revitalization. And I'm sure that all of you can think of ways in which social media, such as Facebook, Twitter, um, and for those of you who are kind of young enough, because I am not young enough to know about TikTok, but this is also proving to be a very interesting platform for sharing resources about language revitalization. Many of you can think of examples. <clears throat> So maybe we can say something like we can have lots of resources. Um, we certainly can have a motivation, a desire, especially amongst um, groups such as this one and all, all of you in the audience, I'm sure, the motivation to reverse language shift and a group of people interested in doing this. <clears throat> and um, some of you will know very basic uh, framework of motivation in language learning, which relies on the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. That is, in the first place, motivation from a sort of inner sense of um, willingness versus the extrinsic um, motivation based on the uh, reward or a kind of threat or instruction. Uh, this is a very um, well-known way of thinking about motivation. Um, and you can see that if you go online and look at language learning apps, most of them are dealing in the question of extrinsic motivation. For example, if you learn Russian, Spanish, Italian, etc., what will this do for you? It will enrich your CV. If you learn English, you'll be more likely to get a job. And this uh, language learning platform, Busu, compiles the seven best languages to learn uh, and why they're useful. So it's really about use, this extrinsic motivation. For minority languages and endangered languages, we know that perhaps one of the cliches is that there is less extrinsic motivation for learning endangered languages. In other, reason, in, in other words, what is our small language, Louisiana Creole, Las Circassian useful for in that big wide world? Why shouldn't I learn English, French, uh, Chinese, um, or indeed Turkish? So learners, people who are interested in revitalizing minority languages and endangered languages, they do have a very high intrinsic motivation. As we all know, it's about heritage, identity, culture, family ties, community is a very uh, close part of our identity and um, certainly in, uh, reinforces the motivations and desires of learners. Now, if we look at the kinds of language learning technology available on the internet now, and I'm talking about websites, but also especially about apps, applications for the smartphone, um, they are designed around extrinsic motivation, actually. So they are designed to provide a reward, like points, 
Um, so it becomes like a game. Or they are designed also to uh, put pressure on people to keep playing the game or keep using the app. Um, and you can see this most famously in the Duolingo app. Any of you who use this app will be familiar with the many notifications which you receive um, when you don't practice uh, at your usual time. Uh, you have these very famous reminders from the Duolingo Owl that you have to practice. And this is a great uh, example of extrinsic motivation, which can be very useful for compelling people to keep practicing. And um, Duolingo is also branching out now to smaller languages. This is an example of the Scottish Gaelic uh, Duolingo. So um, in that case, we have a language which is rather small, but already quite well supported by the state in Scotland, um, which is part of this app. Um, so in many ways, these apps such as Duolingo can give um, a platform for uh, minority language learners um, to keep practicing, to keep learning. But this has nothing to do actually with their intrinsic motivation, which is probably the underlying force uh, bringing them to the language in the first place. You can also see that um, the grammar explanations on an app like Duolingo, for example, are not as exciting looking as um, the learning interface, the main learning interface. <clears throat> and one of the major problems, of course, is that such apps are not available for most minoritized languages, actually. So for a very big, small language like Scottish Gaelic or Irish, uh, it's possible to break into this um, app space. But for much smaller languages or languages which lack state support, it's much more difficult to actually be a part of this growing uh, popular app sphere. So the advantages of these apps can actually be lost on many uh, minority and endangered languages, which simply can't participate in that landscape. Where they can, of course, it's a great increase in prestige and status of the language, and it also serves to raise awareness, perhaps, of the issue of uh, language endangerment and language minoritization in general. But we have to say that actually, even if you're learning a language like Spanish using Duolingo, the extrinsic motivation that you get, these reminders or the promise of a good job after you learn Spanish, this can actually be not very reliable. Um, this is the research on motivation shows that sometimes extrinsic motivation is not quite as good as getting us to learn as intrinsic motivation is. And these apps do lack really strategies for reinforcing and rewarding the intrinsic motivation that learners of minority languages have. So for example, there's very few opportunities to speak with other people who are learning the language, to get to know them, to get to know why they're learning it. Um, even less opportunities, of course, to actually connect with people who speak the language on a daily basis, perhaps because they're advanced learners or maybe even because they're native speakers. And of course, the major, major problem with all of these apps is that they're working on a for-profit basis and they rely mostly on unpaid contributions. So if you're a minority language community, this is not a particularly fair bargain. Um, if you can even manage to get past the gates, which are very well guarded, then actually, you may end up devoting months and months of time and, and, and energy without any pay or reward. This is not ideal, especially because as you all know, I'm sure many people working in language activism are not paid for this uh, and are working one or two normal 
everyday jobs in addition to doing language activist work in the spare time. <clears throat> so it seems to me like these, are, these apps are, are really exciting in many ways, but also are not specifically adapted to the needs of minority and endangered languages. I'll just mention briefly another key concept that uh, we know from the literature on language planning, which is the difference between top-down initiatives, those driven by, let's say, a government or a state organization, and bottom-up initiatives, which are emergent in a community of interested people. <clears throat> in the case of language uh, revitalization, uh, top-down initiatives quite often organize social movements or give funding to uh, existing social movements. It comes into question the status of the language officially in a state or government. Um, and th these sorts of things are, are very valuable, but they're not necessarily uh, the same aims held by bottom-up movements who are usually without much funding and aiming to distribute and develop resources for free or for low cost because the aim is not to deal with some kind of official um, policy making, but rather to uh, promote a social movement. <clears throat> and uh, I think that this will come into play uh, just a little bit later in the presentation. And I'll mention an example of one uh, website, this Memrise website, where users themselves can create their own courses. Um, and this is a sort of flashcards website that's not dissimilar, it's not dissimilar from Duolingo, um, but anybody can contribute. And that's something which the Louisiana Creole Revitalization Project has been making a great use of actually. So just to point out that there are resources available which can be taken advantage of by bottom-up um, uh, initiatives without gatekeeping and which are really uh, through the um, motivation of the people and activists creating the resources. <clears throat> I'd like to bring us to a short case study from Louisiana in the USA, where actually social media has made a massive difference in the landscape of language revitalization. Uh, it's really, really, um, for me, a very interesting case. I've been involved with this um, for 10 years now. Um, and I started to become interested in the language because my father is from Louisiana. So it's part of my linguistic heritage in a way. Um, and then I found the social movement around the language so interesting and fascinating and of course the language itself so, so fascinating that I just kind of obsessively continue to to study uh, this um, so I'll present some findings and ideas of, uh, from that today but obviously there's many 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 things uh, that I would like to say. Now it, these, uh, this was an interesting uh, and rather early story that ran um, in the uh, NPR uh, in 2014, talking about how social media provides new hope for rare languages. And I do think that the Louisiana Creole case shows that this can be true. And I hope that by sharing some examples of how we have been uh, using social media, it might uh, provoke some discussion here um, and uh, maybe I can learn uh, also something from, from your experiences. So we're traveling uh, to Louisiana in the United States. As I mentioned, it was a colony of the French um, and the language that we're dealing with is Louisiana Creole, which is a French-based Creole language. It's spoken alongside Louisiana French Today it has uh, fewer than 6,000 speakers, certainly, um, I think, and all of them, apart from really very few exceptions, they're all over the age of 65 and bilingual uh, in English. 
many of the speakers of Louisiana Creole also speak Louisiana French. And there is no more intergener intergenerational transmission. It has completely ceased. So the language will disappear as a language spoken um, in homes uh, within the next uh, few decades, certainly. This is a bit of Louisiana landscape here. I was um, kayaking in a lake. Uh, this is a famous swamp uh, landscape of Louisiana. And these are the um, cabins which were inhabited by enslaved people on the plantations of colonial Louisiana. Uh, these cabins were the birthplace probably of the Louisiana Creole language as enslaved Africans had to communicate with each other and with the slaveholding families using French and the proclamations of French. And this gave birth to a Creole language. Ah, çok iyi. Yenge ve sol cümleler yapıyordum. Evet. Arkadaşlar, arkadan birisinin e, sesler geliyor. Herkes... Ya, ya, oh iyi oldu. Oh iyi oldu sana. Okay. So, um, in this extract, uh, we can hear somebody speaking the language. I'm just going to check that I can actually um, get the audio properly. So I'm going to reshare my screen, just a second. <clears throat> okay, so you should be able to hear this now. Moi, je l'aime par les créoles, uh, comme au pays par les créoles. Et moi, je crois que tout quelqu'un autour ici dit peut-être comprendre un petit peu créole. Si tu peux, comme moi, dit avant, si tu peux parler de l'anglais, si tu peux parler créole, tu peux courir un tas de places et puis parler créole avec différents monde. Uh, Mo trouve un monde créole qui un tas si blanté, si si blanté, uh, pour d'autres mondes, caring, pour d'autres mondes. Il uh, y a un tas de patience, un monde qui m'a dit parle créole, un monde parle créole, il parle vite. Comme on va dans Houston, il dit, je connais où tu es de tu es de Louisiana, parce que tu parles créole et puis tu parles vite. Les mondes créoles parlent vite et je ne connais pas peut-être même. <laughs> Mais comme je comprends, c'est différent. Tu comprends? C'est pareil comme toi, tu from French. From France. Tu vas parler les mots, c'est comme ça, toi, tu parles French, uh, French, et puis moi, je parle créole. Je ne vais peut-être jamais parler bon French comme toi, comme toi, tu peut-être jamais parler bon créole comme moi. Mais nous comprenons un et l'autre. Et si nous comprenons un et l'autre, nous pouvons faire les affaires ensemble. Okay, so this is um, from a documentary by um, Taylor, who is a linguist who's worked extensively on Louisiana Creole. Um, and he's uploaded his documentary to YouTube for everyone to see. Um, you can check it out just by Googling Louisiana Creole um, and you, you will find it in the results. <laughs> Uh, the situation on the ground in Louisiana is, is quite difficult. Um, many communities which uh, have been Creole speaking historically are plagued by poverty, by environmental problems, um, environmental injustices. Uh, and this goes back to the history of, um, of racial segregation and the history of really uh, in sl uh, slavery in Louisiana. Um, so it's a long and, and very difficult history, which uh, creates a number of challenges on the ground that mean that it's not easy to uh, start language, re language revitalization initiatives because basically as one uh, woman put it to me, there are bigger problems to deal with. <clears throat> in the... Um, late 20th century, it was the era of civil rights, 
and um, part of this was a growing awareness in Louisiana of the importance of heritage languages, the foundation of the Council for the Development of French in Louisiana, Codefil, was um, a major step in creating uh, a state agency for French language affairs in Louisiana. It was charged with creating a series of uh, curricula for uh, French language education in Louisiana, for hiring teachers who could teach French, and for spreading this through all schools in Louisiana. And today, there are many schools in Louisiana which are French immersion, that is, children are speaking and being taught in French. <clears throat> However, this is to the exclusion of Louisiana Creole. So remember, both Louisiana Creole and Louisiana French are spoken in Louisiana. So French is taken care of at the state level, but there has never been any state attention given to the Creole language. And this is partially due to the history of um, institutional racism in Louisiana and the marginalization of the Creole communities Creole-speaking communities because the language has a historical association with slavery. In fact, Louisiana Creole is spoken by um, both black and white people um, as they would identify themselves. But uh, it is the black communities which have been the historical safeguarders um, of the language. So there has been really no institutional support given to organizations such as Creole Inc, this organization here, which is a community organization. It's a bottom-up initiative by uh, Creole speaking uh, and, and people in Louisiana and their friends and families. Uh, it's done a lot to promote Creole culture, but has never received any support, as I say. So there are many, many challenges of language revitalization in Louisiana today. Um, as I've sort of touched on very superficially, I have to admit there are problems involving racism and poverty and classism. Uh, there is a question of the rural population in Louisiana and especially the elderly rural population. These are the people who are most likely to speak Louisiana Creole at least likely to come into contact with the young urban people who are interested in learning the language. There's also, of course, the question of political polarization, which is a huge issue in the United States. Um, you can uh, probably remember the issues surrounding the Trump presidency. Uh, this is a totally um, evolving situation that means that it's actually really difficult to speak to your neighbors in Louisiana because a lot of the time political problems can get in the way of a social movement. So if we're trying to revitalize a language, suddenly a lot of other political issues can become uh, the focus of attention. And this all comes back to, in a way, this, this deep problem in the United States uh, which Putnam talks about in his 1995 book, a loss of social capital. What he means is, you know, people in the United States, they don't know their neighbors. They don't know the people who live next door to them. They drive everywhere and they watch television and they don't walk down the street and get to know what's going on in the area. So this highly atomized culture individual-based culture does not lend itself, in my view, to a kind of community um, organization um, or group uh, activities. So it, this is really a challenge. And um, there are some really good examples of, of uh, people who have tried to fight against this to, to bring the collective and the community into the forefront of people's minds in the contemporary United States in general and in Louisiana in particular. 
So the ultimate destination today is actually Facebook and it's revolving around this page, the Kurivini Louisiana Creole language fan page. This is a place uh, where learners of the language and people interested in the language congregate. And over the past 10 years, a community has formed here online, a community of practice which is engaged in language learning, in the development of uh, resources such as textbooks, um, children's books, an orthography, so a spelling system, um, and uh, many more uh, other interesting resources and activities have been born totally online and have actually given rise to a new, although very, very small group of speakers of the language. They have learned completely via Facebook. Many of them have never spoken a language face to face with anybody before. So the setup of the online space is actually kind of complicated. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not that online communities somehow lack complexity, right? They're really also very, very um, interesting to look at. And in the case of the Louisiana Creole online community, it's actually divided into some different groups of people and different practices. So you have the center of everything, which is the virtual classroom. It's where people can come to learn the language, where they can use dictionaries, flashcards, textbooks, and graphics to write their own sentences or to share video of themselves speaking. And then they can get feedback on this from other learners. There's a fan page which engages with the community at large, and it's through this fan page, if people engage with the fan page enough, then they can be invited into the virtual classroom. The virtual classroom is really focused then on learning the language. It's not just somewhere where you can post anything, your holiday pictures or whatever. It's really a place to learn the language and to practice it. It's led by a group of people called the facilitators. They are a group of more experienced learners. Perhaps some of them have been learning for five years. Um, and they're chief, chiefly promoting the language um, outside of the group. And within the group, they're correcting and helping learners. They're also developing a whole set of resources. I've mentioned some of them, um, including an online dictionary, orthography, flashcards, a textbook and various graphics and videos, children's books, and more and more and more. So the virtual classroom is really enriched by the presence of these facilitators. I'm just going to very briefly show a couple of extracts from two friends of mine. Christoph is the um, force behind the whole online movement. He was the one who really brought it into existence. And Adrian on the right is somebody who learned from Christoph and has gone on to develop many of her own resources for the language. Um, she has helped countless people learn the language through that. So we can see the transmission of the language continues um, even to new learners. So you can just see examples here of how um, Adrian, as an experienced learner, is helping less experienced learners understand the meaning of words. And here in this post, she's setting a challenge um, that it's called the April Challenge. And every day in April, uh, people had to post something in the language about cooking. So every single day, writing something about food. And uh, that's a really popular theme. And like that, every learner has the chance to practice and get feedback. There are also pretty strict rules, as you can see on the left in Christoph's post, about how the group is used, how the virtual classroom is used. It's not 
just a place, like I said, where you can say anything, you can talk about anything. It's really focused on Louisiana Creole language learning and language usage. And um, here are some of the very many resources which exist for the language now, thanks to this vibrant online community. You can see that some of them are based on YouTube. Uh, this here is the course on Memrise. This was the flashcard website I mentioned. There's um, an online dictionary website. There are um, an orthography guide and uh, a book, which has a second edition I'll show later on. There are stories with illustrations. This is by Adrian. Some more by Adrian. This is an exercise for learners learning directions which is used in the group, it can be posted as a graphic and then people can practice in the comments and get feedback. And there's engagement with wider discourses about language endangerment. Here's a post for UNESCO's International Mother Language Day. And here is the um, Louisiana Creole Memorize course. It has uh, 47 levels in this uh, screenshot anyway. And there are really many people learning the language using this. Um, and uh, this acts as another point of reinforcement outside of the virtual classroom. This is what it looks like. Um, as you can see, it's actually pretty similar to Duolingo and its interface. Um, so that's very popular. Here's uh, somebody searching in the online dictionary. And this is a screenshot from a uh, online, oh, actually a completed video of the um, children's story that Adrian created. I'll just play a quick clip. Lons oreiller à lapin. Une fois, lapin t'a pu parler avec Bouki sans ami. Pour qui t'a dit lapin, oh, ma femme fait mal. So in this stories are actually from the website called Story Weaver, which is available for, it was created, I think, in India for indigenous languages of India. Um, you can basically get a ready-made children's book and translate it into your language. And you can either have like a print copy or a PDF copy or a YouTube style video with um, voiceover, etc. So it's an example of how a bottom-up language revitalization community online can actually use resources created in a totally different context. It's in this case in, in India, um, but being used for Louisiana Creole. So I thought this is a really interesting example um, and some really great work. So what I wanted to show is that there's a very rich landscape of uh, material existing for Louisiana Creole online. I also wanted to show that um, there are many people who have taken advantage of this material to learn the language. It's really been quite effective. There have been some, you know, at least probably a couple of hundred people who have come through quite a serious language learning journey using online resources only. And there are certainly now a group of fluent speakers and language activists who have come out of this community over the past 10 years. Now, the question is, and this is a really key thing, what does this mean, actually? I mean, what is the point of this if these people are just talking to each other online? Well, are these people only talking to each other online? Can social media be used? actually to affect real world language behavior and to change the fate of language to promote intergenerational transmission. Um, this is a question that is coming up in so many different contexts. It's great to have these online activities, but the core question is, is it actually going to change the fate of the language? What I've seen over the past 10 years is that there have been an increasing number of points of meeting between the online community and the community of 
elderly or older native speakers. So here's a picture from an event where people get together and speak French and Creole. And in the audience, I met uh, several people who actually had learned about it online, who had learned the languages online, um, and they were now showing up in the real world to speak with native speakers. There's also now um, an ongoing Creole class using online resources, using the orthography developed by the online community, uh, a man called Herbert Wilkes, who is a long time language activist, has been developing uh, a curriculum and actually teaching it. So this was a picture taken in, I think, in 2019 or early 2020, so before the coronavirus pandemic. <clears throat> and I have to say that really, I've been thinking a lot about how the coronavirus pandemic has again changed the amount of engagement between the online and the offline. So what I really noticed during COVID was that suddenly many elderly people who before I could only get in touch with on the telephone, maybe their grandchildren showed them, okay, this is how you get online. Here's a, here's a tablet, here's a phone or whatever. This is how you use FaceTime. This is how you use Zoom, etc. And there were online meetings during the pandemic where young people who are learning the language came into contact with old, older people. Um, we had some webinars that we hosted here in Cambridge online. Um, there were online events from within Louisiana. Um, and it was really fascinating to see the joy that came out when young people surprised elderly people by coming out with fluent sentences in Creole. And it was really exciting to see that. And it brought these two people, two, two communities rather, into closer contact, ironically, online. Um, but still, I think, you know, now uh, that we come out of the other side of the pandemic into the endemic phase, it's really important to continue this energy into schools, into other sites of um, community activity, especially because schools are very fine, you know, but this involves dealing with the state, dealing with the government, and dealing with policymakers. That is very, very complicated. But in-person meetings, getting together in a room, just drinking coffee together or whatever, it's a great way to get things to happen. And that's you know, a, a long-standing principle in many contexts. That engagement between the young and the old can continue. Um, in such environments. Uh, so there is this danger that online communities or online activities can be just a short-lived sort of spark before the language actually disappears. So it's just postponing the uh, total shift away from the language. But actually, if there can be a continued engagement between those using the online materials and those who are native speakers or who are closely engaged with the real world face-to-face -face communities, there can be a chance of prolonging the life of, of online revitalization. And one example, um, in 2020, we released the uh, uh, Tea Leaf Creole, the little Creole book, which is a learner's guide. And this was really this came into existence um, because of a colleague of mine, Nathan Wenty. Uh, we started um, to work together on this after he had the initial idea. And then we brought in um, Adrian from the online community and Herbert Wilkes from the real world community. He's a native speaker and created together a resource that would appeal to as many people as possible. And actually it kind of then has a life of its own and it's being read and picked up by so many different people and used in so many different contexts um, that it becomes quite an interesting case of the online community creating a resource that can continue to 
um, bring energy to the real world use of the language. And I think um, that's my major point is that actually the, the boundaries between online world and offline world are really blurry. And I think this is probably common sense now. It's not that suddenly we are online and that's nothing to do with our real life. Actually, our real life is now so entangled with our online life. Our online identity and our offline identity become increasingly difficult to um, disentangle. And uh, we are doing so many events like this one online all the time. So whether we like it or not, our online and offline persona, our interactions are mutually linked, are enforcing each other, are affecting each other. So when it comes to online language vitalization, I think we just should see that the internet is part of language revitalization and it's, it's a very important part now. And it can actually affect change in many other areas. So the internet is a new domain for language usage. It's a new area for creating resources. It offers really very, very many new possibilities. And I want to hear about uh, your own experiences with this, um, but it does not replace the traditional domain. It does not replace the home, the family transmission. Instead, it's interacting with them. So I think our real task, if we want to think about the role of language, uh, the role of the internet in language revitalization, our real task is to understand how to make sure that this interaction is really effective how to make sure that when we're using social media or online resources, we're actually getting some kind of connections between traditional, older native speakers and younger, excited activists and learners. How do we create a kind of um, energy that, that brings both of these groups together? And I think actually, a lot of it just happens naturally. So that's for me quite an optimistic conclusion, but in, in my experience, I, I really see that um, it happens all by itself. And maybe what we can think about is how to make this as effective as possible. So thank you um, very much for your time and for listening to me, Merci pour Pité, and uh, Talk to Cécilier. I'd be really glad to have any questions and any discussion um, from now. Thank you.